in this lesson, we're going to be taking a look at some different characteristics of polynomials. And so the very first thing we need to do is nail down a little bit of vocabulary. So you want to make sure that you understand each of these terms. Writing them down in your notes would also be an excellent way to deal with that. But it's really getting up to this idea of a leading coefficient. Uh, because the leading coefficient is the coefficient of the first term of a polynomial when it's written in standard form. And so you have to understand these idea of what's a coefficient and what's standard form in order to understand the leading coefficient. And right now we're just taking it as a bit of vocabulary to get to know what the leading coefficient is. But later on you'll find that that number and what type of number it is there as the leading coefficient is going to change some things about your graph and it's going to determine some things. But we just want to get used to the idea right now. But basically the idea of the leading coefficient is that any time we write a polynomial in order from biggest exponent down to smallest, the leading coefficient is whatever number that first variable is being multiplied by. The other piece of vocabulary that we're going to talk about in this is a turning point. Now, a turning point is a point on your graph where the graph becomes horizontal. Now, why is that a turning point? Let's take a look at a couple uh, example graphs. What if I think about a graph that looks like this? You notice it's horizontal right there. That is where it turned from decreasing to increasing. But it's not, we aren't just going to say where it changes from decreasing to increasing, because of course, well, one, it could change from increasing to decreasing, and you have a turning point there. But also, uh, you could have things like our cubic graph where it kind of flattens out there, and it flattens out just at one point here, right in the middle. But at that point, it switched. It was increasing, and then it wasn't. So it turned there, and then it went back to increasing. So that would also be considered a turning point, which is why we define it as the point where the graph is horizontal. And then as we go forward, we're going to see graphs that have lots of those kinds of points on them, where the graph will be considered horizontal because it's turning. And as we get to know the number of turning points on a graph, it helps us to start recognizing what type of polynomial we're looking at on any given graph. And so now it's time to put some ideas together because there is a correlation between the degree of a polynomial, its zeros, and its turning points. So here you see a very basic example uh, you have the equation graphed here of just y equals x. Now, first of all, this degree of this polynomial is a first degree polynomial. Because remember, anytime we write equals x, that's just x to the power of 1. Okay, How many zeros does this graph have? A zero is just another name for an x-intercept. And so this has one zero. And so it crosses the x-axis in one place. Now, I'm not saying that the 0 is 1. I'm just saying that there is one 0 on the graph. And then how many turning points are there? Well, you'll notice that since this one is a line, it is always increasing. It never flattens out. It never hits horizontal. Therefore, there are no turning points on this particular graph. So degree 1 had one 0 and no turning points. If I now come over and take a look at these two, you notice that both of these are second degree polynomials because both of them are x squared. Okay, How many zeros are in each graph? Well, in this first graph, just y equals x squared, there is one zero. In the second graph, you notice that there are actually two zeros because there are two x-intercepts. And so in this particular case, we found that there was one zero or that there was two zeros. And in fact, if I wanted to, I could even take this first graph and if I moved it up just a little bit, there'd be zero zeros in that one. So that is also possible that there'd be no zeros. Okay, now how about turning points? How many turning points are in our graph? Well, you'll notice in our first one that we have a turning point right here where it bottoms out and the second one, we have that same turning point, just it's been moved down four units instead. And so you'll notice that in both of these cases, there is exactly one turning point on our graph.
All right, so notice for our second degree polynomial, we could have anywhere between zero and two zeros, and there was one turning point on our graph. To look at one more example of this, we're now going to look at some cubic functions. And so cubic means that it's third degree, because of course our exponent is three. Zeros, how many zeros are on this particular graph? Well, I see one zero here, because we're only crossing the x-axis at that one point. And how many turning points are there in this graph? Well, I see one turning point here. Also at the same point here right in the middle, because that's where our cubic graph levels out. Okay, so would a cubic graph always then uh, have one zero and one turning point? Well, let's make more complicated ones. These are definitely a lot trickier to graph. Uh, there's a lot more that goes into it, which we aren't going to be necessarily delving into right now. But what we are interested in right now is we're taking a look still at how the degree, and you notice both of those are third degree because the highest exponent is three, how that degree corresponds to the number of zeros and the number of turning points. So in our second graph here, how many zeros are there? Well, we got a zero here and we have a zero here, that is x intercepts. And so that one has two zeros. Whereas our other graph here has three zeros. And remember from our first one we did, we saw that one had one zero. So we've seen that a cubic could have one, two, or three zeros. Okay, well, how many turning points does it have? Uh, in the first one, we saw that the first example just had one turning point in it. But how about these? Well, I have a turning point right here and a turning point right here on my second graph. So you notice my second graph has two turning points. How about the other graph, the right side graph here? Well, this one has a turning point here and a turning point here. Those are the only points where the graph shifts or changes from uh, increasing to decreasing or otherwise levels out there. And so notice it never hit three turning points. So what did we notice in terms of a pattern here? Well, you'll notice then that the degree could always be the number of zeros, but that we would never have more zeros than our degree. So for instance, like with our cubic function here, you could never have four zeros. There's a maximum of three zeros. Now you could have less as we saw, but there's a maximum of three, exactly the same as the degree. That is true for all polynomials. We could keep increasing the degree and we could look at quartics and quintics and see how they change as well and we'd see the same pattern. How about number of turning points? Well, remember with our linear, it had zero turning points. So degree one had zero turning points. Our degree two had one turning point. Our degree three could have two turning points. See the pattern there? A degree four polynomial could have up to three turning points. A degree five polynomial could have up to four turning points. Now it can have less, but that's the maximum. And so we can generalize this rule. Once we know the degree of a polynomial, we know the maximum number of zeros. And if you need to remind yourself that zeros here means x-intercept, add that to your notes as well, that the maximum number of zeros is equal to the degree of our polynomial. And that second part, the maximum number of turning points is always equal to the degree of the polynomial minus one. Now do note, we're talking about the maximum numbers so it doesn't mean that everyone has exactly that many, but it's up to that many zeros and turning points. All right, so make sure you have this down and noted uh, so that you're going to be able to use this on the assignment and remember it for later as well. But now there's one other thing that can come up along the way, kind of combining some of the stuff with polynomials along with uh, work that we've done previously. And that is thinking about how do we find all the solutions to a polynomial like this. We will be delving in how we can do some of this work algebraically, but in the current form of this particular equation that you're looking at, the algebraic methods would be a real pain. And so we want to start by using a method that we can use for almost any different kind of polynomial that we might encounter. And so 
a great way to be able to solve this is actually by graphing it. Now, I'm not one who's going to say you have to use a graphing calculator on this. A lot of people spend tons of time learning how to use graphing calculators in school, and then they don't pick it up again. And I want you to be able to use any tool that comes along. And so what I'm going to suggest is that uh, the Desmos graphing calculator is a great one to use. It's simple. It's easy to use. Is it the only way you can do this? No, not by a long shot. Uh, but it's a great one if you don't have another graphing calculator handy. So make note of that URL, maybe even open it up in a new tab here, because we're going to be using that in order to be able to answer this question. So what I would do is I would take my equation here, and I would actually graph it as y equals that polynomial, and I would plug that into the Desmos graphing calculator. When I do that, this is what I'm looking at. Now remember, I graphed y equals the polynomial over here. I didn't include the equal zero part. Why? Because I don't need to. Because I'm looking to see when this polynomial hits a y value of zero. That's basically what this means over here, is that y equals zero. And y equals zero everywhere along the x-axis. Hence, I could also have asked this question by just saying, what are the zeros of this equation? Because remember, zeros mean x-intercepts. And so if I look along my x-axis here, and I try to figure out where is this actually crossing that x-axis, I can see it happens a grand total of four times. Got one there, 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 and there. Now, in this particular case, it looks like those are actually at nice, pretty whole numbers. If they weren't, we'd estimate. But since these are at nice pretty whole numbers, my first one appears to be at negative 8, going left to right. Then I have one at negative 5. Then I have one at 3. And then I have one at 6. So when I go to then say what my answers are, I would say that x equals negative 8, comma, negative 5, 3, and six. Just separate your multiple answers with commas because we're listing them out. No parentheses though, because we aren't talking about points here like x, y coordinate pairs, but just making a list. And so then that would be your final answer and you'd be done with this one. And all you needed to do to figure it out was to make the graph.